Hey, good morning. I'm Dr. Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System. Welcome back, and thanks for joining us for Open Mics with Dr. Stites. Some people wait to see a doctor until they're sick. But from a doctor's perspective, right, we still want to see patients even when they're feeling well. A routine checkup, also called a wellness exam, is so important. It gives doctors lots of information. We get to see what folks look like when they're feeling well. I can't tell you how important it is to see people when they're feeling well so you understand what they're like when they're feeling ill. And the more information we have, the easier it is to notice when something seems wrong. It may seem simple, but these visits are perhaps the most important interaction you can have with your healthcare provider. Today we're learning what these checkups are like and why you should not neglect your next wellness exam. And let's be clear, just because you're 40 years old and think you feel healthy, you need to see your primary care physician to establish that relationship so they know you on both sides of the wellness equation. First though, we're gonna do our morning rounds. Mammogram recommendations are changing. A draft version of new government guidelines says all women should get breast exams every other year starting at the age of 40. To help us understand this, we have Dr. Annalisa Winblad, a radiologist, and more importantly for us, a breast imaging specialist here at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. These folks have to go get, the, to finish their radiology training, they get specialized training in, in um, breast radiology, and they really help, are a very important part of our entire breast cancer team. Okay, Annalisa, let's have a conversation. So, currently a woman can, what a, what a blessing that is, right? Get mammograms at the age of 40. So what's actually changing here? So breast experts have endorsed routine screening mammograms beginning at age 40 for several years. The United States Preventive Services Task Force, however, has historically supported screening starting at age 50. This has been a hot topic of debate for many years. The task force has now recently issued new guidelines urging women to start screening at age 40. This is a big step in the right direction and hopefully ends the confusion about when to start screening. The task force recommendations are also incredibly important for our patients because they do directly affect payment policies by insur insurers such as Medicare and Medicaid. So hopefully this new recommendation also protects access to life-saving screening exams for our patients in their 40s. You know, that's a big deal. So there must be some science or data that justifies this. Moving the, 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 the goalposts up by 10 years, that's a long way, but then also going to every other year. Talk to us about the data. So we have known for many years, including the task force, um, that screening starting at age 40 saves the most lives. And medical experts have actually been urging the task force to follow the science for many years. The task force now cites new and more inclusive evidence about breast cancer in younger women that has allowed them to expand their recommendations. So the task force has acknowledged that there's an increasing incidence of breast cancer in women in their 40s. And we also know that breast cancer in younger women tends to be more aggressive tumor biology. So when it's not found early, it has poor outcomes. So really it's this whole thing, you know, when we think about screening exams, we know there's a cost to doing that. You have to have a win. You have to have an advantage from doing that, right? And so you're gonna, we're gonna recommend that women get these uh, mammograms now beginning at age of 40, but it sounds like it really saves lives and probably prevents later stage disease. Is that your sense? Absolutely, and I think it's important to note that we recommend women get screened every year, not every other year. Breast cancer is incredibly common. One in eight women will develop breast cancer in their lifetime. When women are screened every other year, they present with larger tumors, later stage disease, and worse outcomes. Unfortunately, the task force did not endorse the recommendation for screening every year, but medical experts continue to advocate for screening every year, as we know this is incredibly important, especially in our younger patients. So going from every year down to every year sounds like a really important move. How will we get there, do you think? What will it take? Well, I think the, the first and most important, you know, is that the task force now aligns with uh, medical societies that recommend starting at age 40. Our next step is to urge the task force to continue to recommend um, screening age 40, but every year. Um, and hopefully this will protect then um, access for women um, 
to breast cancer screening services, notably right now screening mammogram services, so that they're free for patients. We know that when patients um, have to pay out of pocket for a screening exam, it's less likely to be um, scheduled and performed. You know, I, I want to thank you very much. We have an amazing breast cancer team, and I know Dr. Annalisa Winblad has been on this program before. Dr. Winblad, thank you. Dr. Jimmy Wagner and Dr. Anno Day, I mean, amongst many other folks. This is an amazing team, and uh, I think their wisdom should be, should be well received. So thank you for being on the program thank today. Thank you for having me. All I enjoyed right. being here. And we'll see you again soon, I'm sure. All right. When you mark your calendar, you <coughs> hold birthdays, holidays, and anniversaries sacred. Now, I don't want to say Dodgers visits are sacred, but they should be really important to you because why? And you just heard a little bit of a message from Dr. Winblatt about that. We're here to try and help you. We're here to try and save your life or to at least maintain your overall health. That's our job. And joining us here in the studio today, we have to have Dr. Jennifer McRae. She is an internal medicine physician here at the health system. I got here a little early. She made me feel old. She goes, hey, when I was just like a medical student, I remember you doing that. I'm like, oh my God, I've been around a little too long. But we're also pleased to have two of her patients, Jack and Becky Seltzer. I want to say thank you both for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to meet you today. We learned that we are like neighbors on the South <laughs> yeah, Plaza area right. of the city, so that's pretty darn cool. Uh, Dr. McRae, how long have you been the Seltzer's uh, uh, physician? So um, I've been their doctor since like the summer of 2019. They had been following in our clinic previously and then transitioned their care to me when their provider um, moved to a different position. So, you know, I talked a little bit at the beginning of the program about how important it is to see patients when they're well so you have something to compare to, right, when they're sick and they don't feel well. How much easier is it for you to work with patients once you have that relationship established and you see them on both sides of that illness fence? It's, it's very important to have a doctor that you know well and then as a doctor to know your patients well because then I can sense when something doesn't seem right, when someone's weight loss is not a healthy weight loss, when there might be something else going on. I think also by knowing my patients personally, knowing them for a long time, I know what's important to them. I know that the Salzers really enjoy being physically active and they like to ride bicycles um, all over the country and so that's something that then I know as our provider is, is something that I want to help them maintain and protect. Oh, that's cool. So you guys are bicyclists. Mm -hmm. And my son and I are going to the Katy Trail this weekend down the Roachport. That's going to be so much fun. Good for you. Love the Katy Good Trail. You. Love yeah. the Katy Trail. Okay, we're coming back Good. to you now. All right, here we go. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, I'm always intrigued. People go to these minute clinics and urgent care, and they think that's really good medical care and good continuity care, and it's just not. You know, the, the, the struggle is that I know my patients in the cystic fibrosis clinic. I've been following some of them for 25 years or 30 years, and I've known them through so much of their life story. That life story is part of your wellness or your illness. Yeah. And I think the other part of it is because I see them at points when they feel better and points when they feel worse, I understand the gravity of when people feel worse. I think it's really hard to always go to urgent care and think you're gonna get complete medical care. Yes, and I think, you know, when someone shows up and I don't have their complete history, I'm left sometimes wondering if a medication that we end up needing to prescribe for like a urinary tract infection could have a complication. Like if someone has an aneurysm, you wouldn't want to use a fluoroquinolone, which is a type of antibiotic. Uh, and so if their records are incomplete, you really have to do a lot of digging to make sure that the care that you recommend is safe. I think also then knowing Knowing your patients well, I get a sense of how they're going to do, you know, with lab work and with treatment, and maybe if they're a type of person who doesn't like to take medications, what sort of other options do we have for someone as far as like referrals and things like that? So if you're if you have a provider or if you go see a doctor and they don't know you very well, they're really kind of starting from square one, and then they just really have you have to follow the guidelines and not necessarily the patient as a whole person. You know, I, I think that's really a big deal. I, I, I just can't remark enough to our audience, establishing that relationship with a physician isn't about just seeing your patient, your physician at that one point in time. I always tell my patients when they come in, so I want you to reflect on this. <laughs> I can draw a line when I've got two dots. When I just got one dot, I don't know which direction you're headed. Mm. But if I see you in two points, I got two points in time, now I can start drawing the line, and then I have more dots, and I always know where we are. There's, that is such an important concept. I think it's hard for folks to necessarily always believe in that. 
Yes, and I think when someone shows up the first time and they're and they're sick and they're talking about a lot of symptoms, it's hard for me to know is this is this severe fatigue and we need to do a lot of workup or is this someone who maybe just we just need to talk about sleep hygiene and so having really that continuity is important and knowing a person when they're well and when they're not well so you can really kind of try to guess where they're going to go. I think I would call that a darn big deal. <laughs> All right I want to return now to Jack and Becky Selzer. Thank you guys both for joining us. It's really a pleasure to have you here on the program. I told you I wouldn't be too mean about this uh, 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 with you. So a couple of questions. How long did it take you before you felt comfortable with Dr. McRae? I think it was almost immediate. Yeah, it's pretty soon, yeah. yeah. She seems pretty nice. She, yeah. she, she starts yeah. off by hold. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> she, she radiates competence yeah. and, and care. Yeah. Huh? Those two deal. elements, yeah. And so yeah, right away. Now, do you guys go to the appointment? Do you see her together, or do you have separate appointments? We go together usually. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have some. I used yeah. to have twins that would do that with yeah. CF, and, yeah. and they would both come in at the same time. I'm like, oh man, yeah. I got to figure out which one I'm talking to here. Uh, yeah. 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 So, um, so that that's great. And, and what do you think has been the hardest part about getting to know a new physician and making that change? I don't think I felt it was hard ever. I That's mean, I, I've had many doctors over the years. We've been married 54 years, and we've yeah. lived several different places. Congratulations on that. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Yeah. And so uh, when Jennifer Kendall, who was our doctor, told us, we were sad because we loved yeah, her. Yeah, she was great. But really then good. we also knew, well, you know, this is a new adventure. Yeah. So then we met Jennifer, Dr. McRae, and we loved her. Yeah, you know? that's, that, she, that, that's awesome. So. Um, Talk to us a little bit about how some people neglect their physician's appointments. Why did you guys keep your appointments? Oh, it, well, it, you know, I mean, it's a, it, we see it as very important. Uh, it's a, well, it's an opportunity to take a pause, really, and kind of review what what's happened uh, over the last year, and and just listen and talk and exchange ideas and and talk with somebody who really knows stuff about health. Yeah, does that bit about, I need to see at a couple points in time so I really know, does that uh, resonate with yes. you? Yes. Yeah, I it liked does. that. I yeah. liked that physical looking at the dots and connecting them yeah. because that's exactly what it does because then I'm not a stranger to her. See, I think it's really important to not be a stranger. I, just, I think that's critical to how you form your relationship with your, with your physicians. You know, the, you perform at your best as a physician when you know their whole story. If you only know this little bitty piece, it's sometimes hard, but when you know patients a little bit more across and you know a little bit of their lives, I think that gives you so much more information for treating people. Absolutely. You know what's nice when we come in, uh, you, you know that she's really looked at, at our file. Yeah. You know, and, and she's gone through a lot of stuff and all our, you know, all the questions and where we're headed, that's relevant. You that's know, a and, big deal. Yeah. That's right. So now you guys brought a family photo, three kids, 13 grandkids, holy cow, love and joy. There's a lot of love and joy in that picture. Yeah, true. So, uh, so um, is everybody pretty healthy? Yeah. Uh, we have a son that has Wegener's granular mitosis, okay. and That's he's the deal. one on the top left, and he was diagnosed when he was 21, and he's now 48, and he had a, a tracheotomy at 29. Yes. And so he has, his life has been different than yes. he certainly thought. But it's also been blessed, and yeah. he's you do it handled it. We've never heard a complaint, yeah. you know, or poor me. Yeah. You know, he's had wonderful medical care. Well, that, and that's a big, that's a big darn deal, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, having chronic disease in your children, I think you're, you're only as happy as your least happy child. Mm -hmm. Maybe in your case it's grandchild. I don't have that experience <laughs> yet. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah it is good. Okay, so Dr. McRae, how does a wellness exam for patients in their 70s and 80s differ from a younger patient, say like me? So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, why um, <laughs> so a lot of times with a younger person, younger patient who's healthy or hasn't accumulated a lot of chronic illnesses, a lot of the visit is focused on staying that way. Um, making sure that a person has healthy habits, identifying things um, that might be a risk in their personal or family history, and trying to figure out how to keep them healthy or make them healthier than they are. Um, as people age, we all kind of accumulate things like high blood pressure or high cholesterol, and so then those later visits become focused a lot on um, 
making sure we address those risk factors that we know someone has. And then as people get into their 70s and 80s, some of it is also kind of pulling things back. Um, do we really need to be very, very aggressive about blood pressure and risk having someone fall? Do we need to continue to do colonoscopies in someone who's 90 when maybe there's not a lot of benefit but there's a lot of risk? And so that's some of that focus shifts, not that we're not caring for people but we just want to make sure that what we're doing is safe and thoughtful and so some of the focus later on is is really kind of looking at someone's whole history and their medications and being like well what can we stop doing now what do we not need anymore um, there's also a difference for patients who are on Medicare um, there is an annual wellness exam that is actually a very specific uh, sort of set of questionnaires um, and exam and expectations that Medicare has that they want to make sure uh, patients go over with their primary care physician every single year um, to kind of standardize and make sure that we're not missing anything. There's a lot of social factors and questions that are in that. that and that is people say wellness exam and so as a provider I think of that versus an annual preventative physical which we might do in a younger patient that doesn't have maybe quite that same script. Yeah, so that's a, uh, that, that's a really lot of, a, you made some really great points here. And you talked about how we do gather blood pressure, weight, et cetera, but this age thing is real. And, um, and indeed, uh, age is a, I think I said yesterday, somebody, it is a fickle beast, hard to live with, but impossible to live without. <laughs> and so you want to live with it, and you're going to have to make sure you make some adaptations. So what other kind of things do you tell people to do from a lifestyle mm -hmm. perspective as we get into our 60s, that's where I am, I admit it, 70s and 80s. <laughs> I know I only look 40, but that's what <laughs> you do. So it's harder to become more active as you get older, and it's very easy to become less active. So even just maintaining a level of activity where you walk every day or even three times a week is really important to maintaining health later in life. Um, and you know, a lot of us, we deal with things like arthritis and maybe it's hard to kind of get up and get going, but those, those problems only become worse the more sedentary that you are. And so that is very, very important and something that I often counsel patients on is making sure that, that, that they stay active. Um, and, and it doesn't have to be you know, running an Ironman, it's just, just even just walking for exercise. It's important for mental health and cardiovascular health and maintaining that you know, from your 20s into your 40s and your 60s and your 80s really can help keep you a lot healthier. The other thing would be uh, quitting smoking. So smoking is a tremendous risk factor for cancers and chronic illnesses, lung disease, heart disease, and so uh, patients who are currently smoking, trying to help those patients quit smoking is really important for preventing both illnesses you know, now and then also 10 years, 20 years down the road. Yeah, yeah, I think that's really important. So you guys said you cycle all over. How did you get into cycling, and is that a great exercise for you? Well, I, yeah, I, I commuted to work by bicycle for 50 years. Oh my gosh, so, where did you live when you did that? Well, we lived we lived on Gregory, yeah. and that, well, all the way downtown, and then we were 100, 123rd in state line. So, so I have 50,000 commuting miles. So, holy, it, holy. I call my bicycle double martini <laughs> as, a, as a stress reliever. So, <laughs> it, it was it's good. And and Becky's been with me all, all, mm -hmm. all the way. She's My choice was either do it or be at home by myself. <laughs> yeah. And it was much more fun to do it. So now we, we must admit we use e bikes. Okay. Okay. Right. There's still pedal in those stuff. Oh, oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. The one we have, you, there's no throttle. So you have to do something. Yeah, and we make sure that we do. So it just, it's so good just to be outside mm -hmm. and, you know, all that fresh air. And then you do work, but you don't kill yourself. Yeah. How so, old are you guys now? I'm 80. 77. Oh, you kind of robbed the cradle there, did you? Yeah. I did, I did. I, <laughs> indeed, I did. Yeah. I always wanted an older, wiser man. <laughs> <laughs> well done, well done. My wife is six days younger than I am after 36 and a half years. Okay, so important screenings pop up too. Let's talk about some of those. So, American Cancer Society. Cervical cancer screening starts at age 25. Breast at age 40, we just heard about the mammogram starting now at 40. Colorectal at age 45, prostate at age 50. 
Lots of risk factors modified that though. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so those are all guidelines based on someone who's average risk. So other things can really factor into needing to move those those start dates back. And that can be family history, that can be prior medication history, or if you had childhood cancer, things like that. And so it's important not to just necessarily follow those guidelines, but ask your, your primary care provider, you know, when do I need to start colonoscopies? When do I need to start pap smears? When can I stop doing pap smears? Um, so for women, pap smears, generally, there are a lot of different <laughs> recommendations, also depending on your age. And so someone who's average risk could be every three years in their 20s, and and then once you hit your 30s, it could be every five years, but that again assumes someone who is average risk. So if you're on certain high risk medications, you might need a pap smear every year, even though they're normal. And so that's where really it's, it's important to at least see your doctor once a year so that they can look over everything and make sure that th nothing's being missed. Yeah, that's a really important point, getting those things, and that's how I found prostate cancer, and so really a big deal to get that done, and, and I think it's not, people get afraid that somehow medicine is trying to make money off patients, I'll tell you, that is not it, we have more than enough work to do, so yeah. that's not a yes. challenge. It's really about uh, making sure we try and keep you safe and keep you as well as we can. What questions do you wish patients would ask you during an exam? I think, um, I, I really wish patients would ask um, ahead of time if there's something that they don't understand, either about a recommendation that they heard from another physician or a medication that they're on, or something that maybe they heard on social media, and, and you know, having a conversation with a patient like that, maybe explaining how a medication works to treat their diabetes can be really helpful in both my understanding maybe why they don't take the medicine or why they're having side effects from it, and then also for the patient to understand why that medicine is important to take. A lot of people maybe don't understand how insulin works, and so taking, you know, even 30 seconds to explain what that actually does in the body can be really important. And so I find that sometimes playing catch up in someone who maybe didn't understand something and then they stopped taking medicine or you know didn't get the labs that we ordered and then we're trying to kind of go back in time and figure out, well, how do we kind of get back to where we needed to be? Yeah, I think that, that those are great points. And I know now we even have to think a lot about whether patients are safe at home, both from a food perspective and even as we get older, elder abuse. And we know about child abuse, but elder abuse can also be a real thing. So all these things are incredibly important. It's much easier to talk about when you have a long-term relationship with a, with a physician. They see you at multiple points in time. Can't emphasize enough how important it is for everyone to have that primary care physician who they can know and they can trust. Hey, if you have questions, send them in. The links are there on your screen, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, or email the Medical News Network. Let's check in with our COVID count. Doc Hawk is off today. We're happy to have Dr. Matt Shoemaker, you've met him before, in his place. Because you know, Dr. Shoemaker sports the best bow ties. Dr. Shoemaker, <laughs> you knew I was going to get it Thank in you, there. Dr. Stites. You I know, know I disappointed you last time when I had a regular tie, so I made sure to wear a bow tie and a white coat. And you did well today. Thank you for that. Uh, All right, how appreciate. are our COVID numbers, sir? The COVID numbers are exceptionally low today. I mean, Yay. this is the lowest I've seen them. 20 total, six active, zero in the ICU, and zero on ventilators. So uh, very nice trajectory with the trend here locally. I'm loving it. What do you, what do you think makes that up for that trajectory? Why are we seeing it? Um, I think, you know, ongoing vaccination efforts um, and then, you know, I always speculate and this is kind of historical medicine with the warmer weather, people are outside and less congregated uh, and apt to uh, be exposed. You know, I gotta believe that that has had an impact. We've seen it every year the last few years. I think last April we were down to two or three. So getting down to six warms my heart and fortunately also warms our soul because we know that that's a sign of greater safety. I think you're right, probably vaccination and then just a lot of natural immunity from having had this disease spread a lot. I don't think we're out of the woods yet though. No, I don't think so. I mean, I think there's gonna be ongoing community spread uh, with COVID. So we have to stay on top of it and make sure that we uh, pay attention to the upcoming vaccination recommendations that are gonna be coming out from the CDC, hopefully later this summer or fall, and I have no prediction on what they're gonna recommend at this point. Oh, come on, a little one. I mean, I think they'll recommend boosters. I think that they, yeah. I bet they do I too. think the booster will become an annual thing. Um, yeah. You, there is some speculation that they may try to co-formulate it with an influenza vaccination. I'm all about it. It'd be so much easier. Yeah. I had two right here on the program last year, and I'm going to be sporting my tank top again to show you all what it's like one more time. Tidy Whitey, be back in, be back, uh, be back with you. Um, I think there's actually pictures that no one would ever want to see already. Um, so, 
this is a really important question as well. Now, we're going to, we're going to switch gears to talk a little bit about monkeypox. The CDC set a health alert on Monday saying there's a potential risk for new cases. They identified a cluster of 12 cases in Chicago. And there's extra concern because nine of those 12 were vaccinated against mpox. Talk to us about what the CDC is uh, saying there. So for, for one thing, I would, I would make sure people know that it never went away. It's just the, the rate of spread of the virus has slowed down. Uh, we seem to have peaked in the end of the summer of 2022. Uh, so we're still seeing sporadic cases, but not more. Uh, so although the cluster is concerning, it's something we'll keep an eye on. One of the things that came out of the cluster, though, was that nine of the 12 had been vaccinated. So I think it's a good time to, to repeat that, you know, vaccines aren't like a light switch, right? It's not like on or off. Vaccines are like a dimmer switch. They help protect you from disease. They may not prevent it, but they may make it less severe. So in that cluster of 12, none of those patients were admitted to the hospital. Yeah, that's a big deal. So even if you do, it's kind of like COVID. You may still get sick, but you don't get nearly as sick. We know you're probably not going to land in the ICU and your chance of dying goes way down with vaccination. So always important, I think, to stay on top of vaccinations. And, and I get sometimes concerned a little bit about it when folks are saying we shouldn't have mandatory vaccination for children. I'm like, well, so we can have mandatory polo, polo, um, polio instead. Thoughts? No, I mean, I, I totally agree. You know, there was recently uh, a cluster of polio in a vaccine resistant community in uh, New York State. City. So yeah. um, I think, you know, mandatory vaccinations are uh, appropriate uh, in certain situations, uh, although I think all vaccines are appropriate in, in situations. There are some times when the greater good outweighs one's personal beliefs. Yeah, it's, it's, a, big, it's a big question. And, and I know here in healthcare, we see a lot of the results of the patients who choose not to be vaccinated for any kind of disease. All right, let's switch gears now. We're going to go to Alexis Del Cid, who's in today for Jessica. Alexis, good morning. How are you? Hey, Dr. Seitz. How are you doing today? We have uh, quite a few questions. Great. So I want to get to them. Um, Taylor wants to know, how long in advance do I need to schedule a wellness exam? All right. How long? I generally recommend scheduling it. If your provider schedule is open a year out and you are at your visit, go ahead and schedule it. You know, pick a time when you figure you're going to be busy and, and then, you know, you can plan your work schedule around that. Um, I would say at a, generally at a minimum, if you can try for 90 days out, those visits for annual wellness, both the Medicare annual wellness and just a preventative physical are longer. And that gives us time to really be thorough and also cover any new symptoms that you may be having, um, talk about new guidelines, go over your whole medical record. And so those aren't just in a short slot and that they're a little bit harder to find those longer visits because we're also seeing a lot of blood pressure follow up and urgent care visits and things like that. So it's really hard to just call like the week before and and get in sometimes with the provider who knows you well so it, I, I would recommend trying at least three months out um, but it, you know if you're six months out a year out and the schedule is open just book it and then you can always move it around all right I have so a great, uh, uh, good, yeah. uh, Alexis sorry I was gonna ask a question but I forgot it's your turn oh no Think about it. You go. I hope I didn't make you forget your question. I, I've got a really good one that was texted to me. It's about mental health. And I have heard of this happening before, so I want to make sure I get to this. Um, someone wrote in and said, I talked to my GP about my bouts with depression. I'm on a great antidepressant now, been great for a long time. But when I applied for life insurance, it was denied because they pulled my medical records and they didn't like that I was on an antidepressant. So can people keep that private? Is there a way, I think they want me to ask, is there a way you can talk to your doctor about men, your mental health but not have it written down anywhere? Because that sounds horrible that someone's life insurance was denied because of it. That is something that we hear really commonly. I think what's hard about life insurance is that I think maybe unfairly, they characterize depression as a very high risk condition, maybe even higher risk than something like high blood pressure or heart disease. Um, and depression and mental health illnesses are very common. And so those 
sort of restrictions or fears, I think really prevent a lot of people from talking to their providers about it. Things that are important, it's making sure that you have the right diagnosis as a provider down in the chart. Mm -hmm. So if someone is feeling depressed, but it's because they had major life events or they're grieving or something like that, it's not major depressive disorder. It can be something called adjustment right. disorder or grief. And so making sure that's documented correctly can really help prevent these complications for patients later when they are applying for life insurance. I think also yeah. then the only way sometimes things aren't going to show up where an insurance company might see them is if you pay out of pocket, which is difficult and scary and can be right. expensive, especially for medications. I try not to think too much about, um, I want to make sure I give my patients the best care and that they get the right diagnoses and the right medications and so I don't want to leave things out of their medical record because I want other patients providers to see them, but right. it is important to be thoughtful about making sure that you, especially with this particular and kind of unique issue, that you've got the right diagnosis yeah. and um, that everything's documented correctly. So it'd be okay for, for to tell people to talk to their provider about documenting yeah. it properly, maybe use that keyword. You know, the irony is you should be more worried about someone who's not treating their depression than someone who's gone to a healthcare provider, talked yeah. about it, and gotten the medication they need. Absolutely, the, absolutely. You know, the insurance provider. Um, a question from Paula. Do I need my blood drawn at every wellness exam? What do I request? This is a, it depends, question. Um, a lot of it depends on your age and your risk factors. Um, BMI, things like that can inform whether or not you need blood drawn every single year. There are also different societies, just like with the mammograms that we heard about, that recommend different things. So the American um, College of Physicians, ACP, and there's those Choosing Wisely campaigns say that we don't necessarily need labs every single year and every single patient, especially if people are healthy. And that can definitely increase healthcare costs. And if someone has a high deductible plan, it can be expensive. However, a lot of insurance um, plans will cover annual labs as preventative labs that are entirely covered, you just want to check on your on your benefits. Um, but technically, no, unless you have risk factors and those things need to be checked on. But that can also be if you're on certain medications, if you take a lot of ibuprofen, I'm going to want to check your kidney function. Um, if your BMI is 29, I might want to just check, you know, screen your for diabetes, check your cholesterol, things like that. And so odds are you're probably going to need labs at least sometime before <laughs> you turn 50. Um, but again, it's, it's a good question to ask your doctor. I have another question from Joellen McGranahan, one of our um, frequent viewers. She writes, in some families, wellness, health care, and dental care is a priority. In others, dental care is not a priority. Comments from guests. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, I think that is just another kind of strange thing about medicine is that we somehow treat the mouth and the teeth as though they're completely separate from the rest of the body and the insurance is different and the training mm -hmm. is different and I think that's what makes dental care really hard because it can be very expensive to maintain good dental health. But then you run into problems with not being able to eat a healthy diet if you're having um, issues with your teeth or uh, pain which can then can cause problems like high blood pressure or needing to take medications you wouldn't necessarily otherwise need. And so I think again just like preventative health care and talking about why it's important to stay active into your later years, maintaining good dental health early will prevent a lot of those complications later that then become more expensive and more difficult to address. You know what, let's stay on this for just a moment. So yeah. because Dr. Shoemaker, you know what happens when patients come in and their dentition is not as great as far as risks of infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we know that, you know, poor dentition leads to, to worse outcomes al along a number of things. But for what I, from what I see in, in my practice as an infectious disease doctor is, uh, we can see anything from just a routine dental abscess to severe head and neck infections with uh, infection spreading all the way down into your chest that can be life-threatening. So uh, it's interesting Dr. McCrary uh, responded to this. I too, in my practice, you know, outside of the hospital and the clinic, I see HIV patients longitudinally and this is a, a common question I'm asking them is when is the last time you saw the dentist and how can we get you back there? Yeah, so. Do you guys get regular dental checkups? Fortunately, we do, yeah. yeah. And who's got the best teeth? She, uh, uh, she has more. Yeah. 
<laughs> but mine are better. <laughs> oh, so you say. Yeah. So you, your doctor just laughed at you. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah. All right. We're back with you, Alexis. <laughs> Those are some great questions. I have uh, one more. And this okay. again, well, this comes from Terry. So Terry wants to clarify this is another mental health. So can I discuss mental health at a wellness exam? Heck yes. Yes, absolutely. And, the, and I think yeah. that's one of those things that we really do want to talk about because it can impact so many other <laughs> things moving forward in your health from that visit. That's also why if you notice when you go to the doctor for kind of any visit, but especially for your annual visit, that there are a lot of questions that you're going to be asked, a lot of um, screening questionnaires before the doctor even gets into the room. And some of those are... Um, access to food, social determinants of health, and then there are significant, like mental health screening tests that we want to try to do on everyone at least once a year, but oftentimes more frequently, because we want patients to let us know if they're struggling with mood disorders or sleep or anxiety or things like that. Um, so we can help connect them to, with the right resources um, and support groups and try to get referrals in early because it's really hard to establish with a psychiatrist or a psychologist. And then also mo primary care physicians, general internist, family medicine, and pediatricians, we're all trained to at least get things started. So if someone needs a medication, we can start a patient on a medication, do some counseling, get things going, and you may not need a specialist. And that's another reason why we want to hear about your mood and we want to make sure that we can be helpful um, with that. I think also sometimes um, a low, low mood or symptoms of depression can be a sign of something else that's going on. And so we want to hear about all of your symptoms that you're worried about because it might actually be something else. You know, it's, it's, I think it's a really important point too because when your heart hurts or somebody have a heart disease, yeah, maybe you'll have some chest pain or you'll have, your, you'll have palpitations, your heart goes too fast, too slow, whatever. You can't breathe when your lungs are not right. And, 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 and so there are real symptoms of it. When your mood is different, that can be a sign that there's a problem inside your brain. Your brain's an organ, right? And we want to think of his mental health as being something very willful. But the reality is our brain is an organ. We have to think of it as an organ. It is absolutely part of well-being. It is absolutely part of wellness checks. And it absolutely needs to be followed over time. And again, another argument for seeing your patient, your physician, at more than one point in time. Don't look at a wellness check as something that's optional and something, well, maybe I should do. No, it's something you really need to do because when we see you uh, at one point and then your brain hurts at a later point we'll know of the difference we'll understand that I can't emphasize enough how important it is to know your patients when they're well so you can really help them when they're not well Hey, this has been a great program. I'm really glad to meet our guest today. I hope I see you on the streets. I, you. I think I may have seen you biking to work. Did you ever bike along Ward Parkway? Uh, rarely. I, I stay off busy streets. Okay. What did you do when you lived out at the 100 and whatever and tried to bike to work? I, well, I had a lot of side streets. Okay. A lot of side streets. Yeah. Okay. That was impressive. That, that's how you stay alive. Yeah, that's probably, <laughs> yeah. I, I believe that. Yes. Well, I'll look for you over in the south side here. And, uh, Please. And we'll see it. That's awesome. So thank you guys for being on the program today. I want to get some final thoughts from everybody. And I'm going to start, Dr. McRae, with you. I think that a lot of people worry sometimes about going to the doctor because you worry about feeling sick or needing to be on medications, but most providers, especially primary care providers, we are there to try to help you feel the best that you can be and live the best life and have the you know, relationships and activities and things like that that are important to you. So please don't be afraid to come and see us. We want to see you and we want to help you. Yeah, such an important deal. Okay, Jack. Uh, you know, it's been great being here, uh, you know, great to talk about the wellness checkups. I think they're essential. I also like the my chart situation mm -hmm. because, and I'll find on there the results of my, my checkup. So, I mean, and they're, they're, it's, my chart's getting better and better every year. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Becky. Well, I also like televisits. I like it when I can do mm -hmm. the, uh, my wellness checkup through home. I, mean, I think once a year I should come in. But it is nice to just be able to do it on the uh, computer. It is. Absolutely. It and is. we appreciate Dr. McGray and all she's done. Well, that's so great they like you. All right, well Very done. much. All Very right. much. Dr. Shoemaker. Um, Doc Shoe. That's I got Doc Hock. Now you're Doc Shoe. I like Okay. It. We'll take it. All right. Although I had a patient call me <laughs> yesterday, the uh, bow tie big, the big guy with the bow tie. 
<laughs> Big guys, interesting. Can I say your bow tie's a little off kilter, and I think you got more pins than known to man in that left pocket. Here. I mean, we are. You know, ID notes are really long, so we have, to have a lot of pins. <laughs> the got um, Impox is disproportionately affecting the LGBTQ plus community, but it is not a gay disease. You know, you've heard me drone on and on about this when I talk about HIV. Viruses don't care. Viruses are looking for a host. So if you think you're at risk, contact your health provider. We have vaccinations here at KU, and we can help to keep you safe and, and keep you educated and up to date. You know, I know um, I've tried to stay well over the years by seeing Dr. McCoy on Star Trek, but the reality is that you, that's a pretty amazing television that kind of just say, but the reality is seeing your own physician makes all the difference and having that relationship, having those points in time where you can relate to your physician and they really know what's going on with you, it makes all the difference. We talked before about faith, hope, and science. Sometimes just knowing your provider is the most important thing. Hey, thanks again to all of our guests and to our audience. What we say, faith, hope, and science here on Open Mics. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update, a new type of drug can find cancer and link it to your immune cells. I'm Jessica Lovell. On the next Morning Medical Update, we meet the first patient in the U.S. to get the fully approved treatment and why doctors jumped at the chance to use it Thursday at 8 a.m. I'm Alexis Del Cid on the next All Things Heart. We only get one body, so might as well treat it well. It's a prescription you can't fill at a pharmacy. Exercise as medicine. The doctors who practice what they prescribe. Thursday morning at 10 a.m. Subscribe to our morning medical update and open mics with Dr. Stein's podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.